Hello and welcome to ZSL Wild Science Podcast. I'm Moni Böhm, Research Fellow at the Institute of Zoology here at the Zoological Society of London. And I don't know about you, but I can smell something fishy. And that's not because of lack of personal hygiene, but it's more because we're heading back to the marine realm today to explore how electronic animal tracking has revolutionized marine conservation. In short, we celebrate technology and how it has helped us advance marine conservation. Now, I'm always game for a good party, and with me to have a whale of a time, it's Mike Williamson. So Mike is a PhD student here at the Institute of Zoology and at King's College London. And amongst many things, he's interested in tagging technology for marine wildlife and also in extensive use of bad puns. So overqualified for this podcast, really. Yeah, if you need a pun, just let me know. Tumbleweed. <laughs> yeah, there was a bit of tumbleweed there. <laughs> Minnow. So Mike, your PhD, what are you doing day in, day out? Well, I use data from acoustic telemetry tags. So these are small tags that release a bit of a ping, a noise, um, rather than your traditional satellite tag, which releases a signal up to a satellite. Effectively, these work as oyster cards. So I'm using data where researchers have gone into um, the British Indian Ocean Territory and they have put these tags into sharks and there's a big receiver array dotted around the area. So effectively, we've given these sharks an oyster card and we can see where around this area they go. British Indian Ocean Territory, of course, a little bit outside zones one to six. A little bit outside of that, yes, money. So do you get to go there as well? I hope so. I haven't been out yet, but there are plans in the works for me to go out and spend about a month on a boat there. So that should be fun. So what animals are you putting these tags on? So there's a couple of species I'm working with, which is uh, grey reef sharks and uh, silky sharks. But there are multiple um, reef sharks that use the area, but those are the two ones I'm focusing on. So what's been your best technology moment in the wild? We, were, we ran out of suction cups while tagging humpback whales in Canada. Of course you did. Yeah, so we had to go to a big hardware store like B&Q and use one of their suction cups, which in turn, it turned out, worked a lot better than the specially designed ones that we were using from the supplier. And rather than the tags staying on the animals for 12 hours or maybe up to 20 hours, we had them regularly staying on for 40 or 50 hours. So you're getting a lot more data points. So it goes to show that you can use some household things and MacGyver it a little bit. And it doesn't always have to be the most expensive option. So to illustrate how far we've come technology-wise, maybe we need to revisit the olden days and how marine biologists worked before technology became all snazzy. So let's ask Dave Koenig. So Dave is a postdoc here at IOZ and lover of all things marine. And I once made him a paper mache mangrove hat to wear on his head. So Dave, today we're celebrating how far we've come in marine science thanks to technology. Can you set the scene? Why is it important? We're currently in a situation where over 90% of fish stocks are either overexploited or at the maximum sustainable yield level. And we have species like sharks, a quarter of those are threatened with extinction. So we really need to get a better handle on marine conservation. And to do that, we need a better understanding of the ecology of these animals. And tracking technology can be one tool that can give us a real insight into the behaviour and life of these animals and hopefully inform the future conservation of them. How were things done in the olden days? Surely there were marine scientists before we had more snazzy technology. You know, like in the days of like really chunky mobile phones? We've been attaching devices to animals for years. And if you go back to World War I, people were putting cameras on pigeons in order to take aerial photographs and reconnaissance missions. But in the marine world, it didn't really start properly until the 60s when a researcher called Jerry Coyman worked down in Antarctica to deploy tags on Weddell seals. He had this genius method of taking a chainsaw, cutting a hole in the ice, knowing that the seals would use this hole in the ice to come up and breathe. And he'd essentially use that to pull the seal out, attach tags to it. And it was the first application of new biologging tags. So this was in the 60s, and since then, the field has kind of exploded, and now everything from birds through to whales through to smaller reef predators like groupers are being tagged. So the field is incredibly exciting, and it's moving forward all the time. I love the idea of just cutting holes in the ice and waiting for a seal to turn. <laughs> it's genius. Well, actually, the tag that they developed was kind of jimmied together from a, an old kitchen timer. So it's a pretty nifty bit of ingenuity. Did it go off after five minutes? No, it was 60 minutes. <laughs> Eggs overcooked. 
analysing the data, how far has that come in the last, say, 50, 60 years? Yeah, well, with analysing all scientific data, you know, the, the kind of the technological age, the increased accessibility to R code and analytical tools has really meant that there's a whole kind of swathe of students and researchers coming through now who are able to apply these techniques. So in the kind of age of big data, we're really starting to get a, a good grips of what these animals are up to and where they're going and how hopefully we can better manage them. And so what's next on the horizon for marine technology? What I would like to see on the horizon is peer-to-peer communication with tags. So that means tags communicating with each other underwater in real time. So we're on the kind of precipice of that. We're on the terrestrial world. The Mataki tags that are in part developed here at IOZ have peer-to-peer communication between seabirds. What we'd really like to do is apply that technology underwater with all the additional challenges that come with tagging underwater and really get that technology going and start learning how animals are interacting with each other. So Mike, once you get your data back, I assume it's not like the PhD is over now, you have to actually analyse it. What does the data kind of look like that you get back from this? There must be a massive volume of stuff. Yes, um, we've got lots of data, up to about a a million points in the current data set, which is a very large data set on multiple species. Each one of those is a single line on an Excel spreadsheet, which tells you where the shark was in the Indian Ocean and at what time. And you now have to troll, pardon the pun, through this to address what question specifically? We're looking at how these two shark species try and use this um, marine protected area in the British Indian Ocean Territory. So we're trying to find out how these species use the areas in different ways, if they're particular areas of the reef they prefer at different times of the year. And then eventually I hope to look at the environmental drivers of this movement by integrating data such as sea surface temperature or current to see what are the drivers causing that type of movement. So while you're like telling people that, oh, it's in the British Indian Ocean Territory, you actually sat at a computer here in London trawling through data. Yep, sadly at the moment, but maybe I'll get out or I'll just be sat at the computer for the rest of the PhD. Uh, Science is not all glamorous. It's not. Oh, Mike, we're getting a bit shark heavy on this podcast. Shall we talk marine turtles? With us now is Matthew Witt, who is a marine scientist and conservation biologist at the University of Exeter. And his main focus is on animal habitat use and human wildlife conflict. Matthew, when it comes to the seas, how do we go about monitoring where animals go? Sea turtles, for example, are, are they highly migratory? Sea turtles can be highly migratory. It depends on the species that you're working on. Certainly the best or most well-known ocean migrant is probably the species that I work on the most, and that's the leatherback turtle. They can disperse across ocean basins. But then other turtle species can too. Loggerheads and green turtles do some phenomenal migrations, but really the leatherback probably is the top trump of ocean migrants for the marine turtles. When it comes to these big distances in a pretty inaccessible habitat, how do we use technology then to find out about these animals? Before the advent of technologies like satellite tracking, much of what we learned from animal migration was done from little metal or plastic tags. You'd encounter the animals, for turtles at least, on nesting beaches, or you'd catch them in foraging grounds. You'd put tags on, little plastic ones or metal ones, and then you'd just hope in the future somebody would find it. And you'd never really figure out their, about their migration, but you'd certainly know if they moved. You just never knew how they got there. Also, you'd learn whether they never moved because you just keep recatching them. And then around about the late 70s, there was a satellite system that went up called Nimbus, which is one of the prototype satellite tracking systems for animals. And then by the early 1980s, along came this fantastic system that now many marine researchers use called the Argos system. And that lets us fit these little electronic packages to animals, let it go off and do its own thing. In the case of marine turtles, every time they breathe, up they come, they blast transmissions into the atmosphere and then if there's a satellite going above that has the receiver on it, you get your locations and that's how we've managed to learn of some of the most fantastic migrations that marine animals do. It's really revealed all sorts of things about individualness in animals that we'd never thought that they had, the types of places they go, how quickly they get there, how long they stay there and then more recently the types of threats that they encounter. So yeah, using these technology, what kind of conservation issues are you trying to tackle with your research? For me and all of the people in my research group, we're really very focused on understanding where animals go, but also understanding the types of threats that might be in those habitats. Because largely many animals that we work on in our group, they're long-lived, they're slow to mature, 
and they have late stage reproductive activity. So it takes some years before they're reproductive. And that's meant that they're very susceptible to exploitation. Really, we use the technology now to understand where the animals go, but we use exactly the same technology, the same satellite systems to understand where the humans go. We look at the human activities, we put these information on top of each other, and we try and understand overlap. And once we understand overlap, hopefully you can mitigate some of the potential threats that you think human activities might represent to those animals. So how do you find out where humans go? I assume you don't go out tagging humans. You don't, <laughs> but many of the world's fishing fleet are tracked by exactly the same Argos system. They have beacons on board. They communicate different types of packages of data, but CLS, who are the company that run Argos, run many of the world's VMS systems, these are vessel monitoring systems. And from VMS data, you can plot out the position of a boat. A boat is in fact driven by an animal, just the animal is called a human. And so the system and the analytical techniques and everything you've developed for animals in the last 30 years can now be applied to fishing vessels or other boats that have this system on it. We can track humans as much as we can track non-human animals. And so we can study the movement ecology of fishing boats. Utterly. And all of these words that you think of in animal movement work like residency and fidelity, they apply to fishing boats and humans as much as they do to any other non-human animal. All this data coming in, how do you process that masses of data? So if I take you back in time, maybe 15 years ago, researchers around the world would put out three, four, five tags, and you could pretty much process them by hand. You could do it in Excel. It would be clunky, but you could do it. But actually, has technology costs have come down to some extent? Competencies have broadened, and there's uh, more of a, an agenda of training people to do this work. So the number of tags has increased. And that's fantastic, but then you're just left with this challenge of like, can I really manually process 200, 300, 400 tags worth of data? And so that's where the advent of programming languages moving into the conservation world has been really helpful. One of the really dominant ones is R. You can't really go through a university system anywhere in the world now, probably without knowing or encountering this thing called R. And it allows you to bulk process data. So the types of things you do on one animal, you could do for a never ending number of individuals. You kind of write these little instructions. It's a recipe. And you just say, apply this recipe to animal A, but also apply it to animal Z. And that consistency is great because then you're treating the data properly. Everything's really similar. Along with all of this has been the greater push to use remote sensing data. So these are other satellites up in the atmosphere looking down at the world. And they produce us beautiful imagery of temperature or food availability or depth. The kinds of things that you think humans and animals might make decisions on. And so actually now we're using things like R or other languages like Python. You can bring all of these data together and actually produce some synthetic, beautiful maps that are contextualised with things like human threat or things like sea surface temperature. And you can figure out how animals make decisions about where they go diverse life of a scientist we do computer programming too we Everybody? do my lectures i teach it now so the modules i teach at the university of exeter all have r they all have ArcGIS in them they have a tiny bit of python so that i know that as well as being fascinated by my science at a very like personal and kind of selfish level i'm making sure that it sounds cliched but the generations of people that go ahead of me are tooled so that they can do these types of analysis as projects get larger and larger and larger and that we don't send new conservation biologists out into the world being unable to process data. So it's all about capacity building so we can actually use this technology into the future as well. I'd say so. I think as a holistic conservation biologist, not only do you have to be fascinated by your species, deeply fascinated to the point that you, you work ridiculous hours on it, but I think you need to understand that you only have a limited capacity. What was my career, say 40 years by the time I retire? If I'm that interested in conservation biology, then I'm interested in the holistic stewardship of the planet. I think that puts pressure on me to make sure that people ahead of me are trained to do the types of things I do and probably do it better and in more advanced ways as technology progresses. Well, that was a bit intense. Very intense. Very technological. What have we learned so far? I think we've learned that it's pretty difficult to tag in the marine environment, but over the years there's been numerous technologies that have been developed by lots of different scientists to tag lots of different species. So I learned that, that I suppose in the early days, at least for turtles, it was very much like bird ringing, putting plastic tags on individuals and hoping they would resurface again at some point. 
And I've learned that the first tag for seals was a modified kitchen timer that they used for um, finding out how deep seals went in the Antarctic. Now I would assume that some of the equipment that goes onto these marine species is actually quite expensive. I'm sure, you know, a shark isn't just going to go and, you know, hand bag a tag once it's full to you. How do you not permanently lose really expensive equipment? Well, it depends on the species. Some species, such as turtles and seals, they'll haul out to the same site each year. So you can go back to the beach and pull your tag back off the animal and collect the data. However, some animals, such as whales and sharks, aren't so good at staying in the same area. So they have clever engineering, which allows these tags to pop off into the ocean. I thought you meant the whales and sharks and no. clever engineering there for two seconds. <laughs> Very clever engineering in the world. You can then collect these tags using VHF or GPS tags. But however, sometimes you don't get the tags back. The tags stay floating in the ocean where they send all their data up into a satellite which you can download. So even though they are expensive, the tags may stay out on the ocean. But the most important part is the data. And as long as you get that back, that's where the real value is. So when you say VHF, that means that somebody actually stands out with a little aerial yep. trying to listen for that little ping sound and trying to hone in on and retrieve. Yeah, you'll sit out at the front of the boat, often during the worst weather conditions, getting punched around and trying to um, find the tag amongst loads and loads of waves. So do all tags come off that easily? No, some acoustic tags that I've been using, you actually sew them into the body cavity of the animal. So you do a little surgical operation and that means they can last a lot longer. So they can stay with battery life for maybe up to five or ten years now. Where the satellite tags, which are much bigger and collect different types of data, may only like last a year or so. Right, so let's get our second Dave on this podcast. Now, if you want to work on all things marine here at our Institute of Zoology, seemingly it pays off to be called Dave, unless you're a Mike, of course. That's also fine. Now, Dave Jacobi is also a postdoc here at the Institute of Zoology and also a lover of all things marine. However, the main difference between the two Daves is that I once made him a paper mache eel hat. So Dave, how has technology revolutionised your world? How has technology revolutionised my world? That's a fantastic question. It's provided us with a way of understanding something about how sharks are moving, the habitats they're using, the environments that they favour to feed in, to mate in, the nursery areas that they use. And it really it gives us an insight and a window into animals and species that we have no understanding of in, in many instances. Because they live underwater and they rarely surface, that we really are pushed to understand what the ecology of these animals are. And that information is fundamental to their conservation and fundamental to management strategies for things like marine protected areas. So if that's revolutionising my world, then it has revolutionised it. It totally has. So when you started out, were you thinking more like, oh, I really want to apply technology, or were you just thinking, I want to know all about sharks? I was always a massive shark geek when I was a kid. I used to learn the Latin names when I was about six, which I don't know what that says about me. But I definitely came from an ecological background and a behavioural ecology background. So I was always interested in why animals make the decisions they make, what drives them to aggregate and socialise uh, and move in different ways. And I would say the technology has been applied on top of that interest to get an insight into species that it's hard to visually monitor or observe. And is there a conservation application of your research and the data you're collecting? There is. So I work predominantly in the British Indian Ocean Territory using acoustic tracking to understand the movements and habitat connectivity of reef sharks in that area. I'm keen to understand how they move between different islands and how that dynamic movement makes them more or less vulnerable to illegal fishing activity that goes on in the reserve. So Biot, or the British Indian Ocean Territory, is uh, one of the world's largest marine protected areas and covers an area of 640,000 square kilometres and we have one enforcement vessel to cover that whole area. And this is a real challenge, is where do we send the vessel to be most effective at protecting the animals in the MPA? And so the angle of my research is really, can we understand the ecology and the sort of hotspots that occur within different species to try and direct where the enforcement vessel should be to be most effective? And we use network analysis to do this, and we use acoustic tracking behaviour to try and get to the bottom of some of these questions and hopefully directly inform how the MPA is managed. So network analyses are, a, I find, a fascinating kind of scientific discipline that's developed across numerous different subjects from physics to mathematics to computational sciences and social sciences and it's essentially looking at how things are connected so you have what we refer to as nodes which can be anything from individuals to locations 
and edges, which are things that connect those things, that which can either be some form of association, some form of a communication, or movements between different areas. So we talk about spatial networks for the reef sharks, and that's how animals move between different areas and connect different areas. And we can use network theory and network statistics to tell us something about how that landscape is connected and what that means for both the ecology and the conservation of things like MPAs. And also how it makes them vulnerable to aggregation. So sharks aggregate a lot. And we can use social network analyses to look at the drivers of aggregation. They hang out together. They do hang out together. They socialise. And we we still don't know why, really. Because they're friends. How do you day-to-day actually deal with all the data that comes in? There must be an onslaught of information now that we can capture stuff even remotely when we're not there. Taking bio as a good example, we have over 350 tags deployed on different species and they've been swimming around in an array of acoustic receivers for getting on for six years now. And so we have in the region of one and a half million data points at the moment telling us about where these animals are through time. So we've adopted a number of machine learning approaches to try and infer um, networks from the data, algorithms to search for patterns within those data. But quite often it just comes down to hard graft and sorting and subsetting the information to probe the questions you're most interested in. What are the challenges ahead? What are the challenges for technology in marine environments? Where should we go next? The challenges for marine tracking have been the same right from the inception, and that is as soon as you put technology and electronics underwater, they yes. tend to fail, and it makes them incredibly expensive. So the housing for tags is incredibly expensive, which puts uh, marine tracking devices way more expensive than, say, t- the terrestrial equivalent. So that's a challenge, and that remains a challenge. The future directions that I foresee is trying to develop more open source tracking technology using crowdsource funding and crowd purchasing, which brings down the overall cost of each individual device. And this will open tracking technologies up to a whole host of people at different levels of their career and in different countries. Because of the major limitation of cost at the moment, that's been really prohibitive to now. So we're really looking towards these kind of open source, uh, low cost almost lo-fi solutions to some of these questions now so that we can increase the number of animals that we can track at the same time. One of the important elements that we need to consider when we think about tracking and marine tracking is the idea of ethics. So all of the procedures that we go through to attach a device to an animal need to go through strict ethical review and that helps refine the capture and handling time of that animal. It helps minimise the effect on the biology and the physiology of the animal that you're tagging and it helps to maximise the kind of payoff for the short-term stress to the animal for the long-term gain of the data that that tag is going to collect. And that's a really important thing to get across. So Mike, how do you tag a shark? That very much depends on the species. In Bayat, uh, the British Indian Ocean Territory, we use hand lines. That sounds dangerous. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's basically you fish for the sharks using barbless hooks so um, they don't hurt them, and we bait them with squid or fish. You then reel them up close to the boat and you turn them upside down. And this has the effect of putting them into tonic immobility, which is a bit of a coma-like stasis, effectively putting them to sleep. And that enables you to undertake a procedure where you can insert these acoustic tags that I've been using into the body cavity, or you can put satellite tags on a dorsal fin. And that procedure lasts around four minutes or so before you release them and they swim away pretty happily. Excellent. That sounds not entirely like my gin and tonic immobility that mm-hmm. I sometimes suffer. Some species are not able to be caught on lines such as mantas or don't do so well on lines like hammerheads or are too big like great white sharks. So we can also use pole or modified spear guns to attach a tags to the outside, to the bottom of the dorsal. However, they may not last as long externally opposed to internally. So that's when you see people standing on a little boat with like a massive pole and a tag at the end and then they suck a cup it on it. Exactly that. Right, so again, that was a little bit shark heavy, so surely not all marine life is in water. Let's come up for some air. What about seabirds? How can we use technology to see where they go and how they might be affected by threats such as fisheries? Well, next we have Dr. Henry uh, Weimerskirch, and he's the director of uh, research at CNRS and the head of the Marine Predator Group there, which is probably the coolest name for a research group. Predators. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. far, I think that's... <laughs> and he's worked for 40 years on seabird ecology, with albatrosses being one of the main focus of his research. So why albatross research? Why? Because they are nice birds. <laughs> no, and they are large birds, easy to work. So that's why we have this long-term program on the albatrosses that started 60 years ago, and I work on them since 
40 years now. During the, the main course of the research, we found in the uh, 90s, early 90s, that there was a, a big problem in terms of conservation because we found that the population was declining very steadily. We started with wandering albatrosses, but other species also are declining. So there was a main conservation issue. So how can technology help us studying albatrosses? So, in many ways. So it depends what kind of research. So there is a research applied for conservation and there are pure research. So we use technology for both parts. At the beginning, in, the, in 1990, we, we started to answer some basic questions about the ecology of the birds, so from where they are going, where they are feeding. Uh, so this was the first question, because we were the first to put satellite tags on birds. So, oh, wow, uh, so we, we, we discovered at this time that the birds were going very far to find the food when they are breeding. They are going up to two or 3,000 kilometers, covering 15,000 kilometers in a single trip. And so from this, a lot of questions came out. How, uh, are they able to do this in terms of energy? Why are they going so far? Or are the prey distributed? And so at this time, we use some new technologies, for example, the heart rate recording of the birds when they are flying to record energy expenditure. Uh, we use also some tags that record the temperature of the stomach of the bird to record at what time the birds are swallowing prey. So this kind of question to answer this pure research question about the ecology and, of the birds. And what about the more applied conservation Yeah, and so question? at the same time, we were uh, developing all these different loggers to answer this question. So we found out that there was a big conservation problem. Population were declining. So the first thing we saw, because we are doing also demographic studies, so we knew that the problem came from a, a mortality of females. Females were dying in large numbers, adult females in the population. When we discovered this, this was in, in the mid-80s, uh, so we didn't know where the females were foraging because there was no tracking data. And so when we had this first data, we saw that the females were going in subtropical waters and also we found some females with uh, some hooks on the beak, so hooks that come from the tuna fisheries. That's how we started working on this conservation issue, so to try to understand why the population was declining, where the birds were going, and after trying to work with a fisheries manager, with authorities, to develop a conservation measure, in fact. If you talk to, say, policymakers or fishermen, then you get all this data coming in from your technology, but you then somehow have to visualize it to kind of get the message across. I suppose that's also technology yeah, in many yeah, ways, mm -hmm. is how to yeah, decode so, all that information. Yeah, yeah. so you, you have, of course, to analyze the data, show the distribution of the population, females, males, in relation to fishery distributions, how it's changed over the season how mortality by the fishery can induce the decline of the population, whether it's sustainable or not. Perhaps you can kill a hundred or thousand of albatrosses and it has not an effect because the population is large enough to sustain a small additional mortality, which was not the case, of course. But all this, you have to develop it, to show it to these people, to convince them that there is a problem. And the problem comes from the fishery and that they have to change the way they are fishing. So to get all this data, you first need to tag an albatross. And how do you tag it? So how we tag? So albatross is quite uh, easy. We f first try to use harnesses, but on seabirds, harnesses are not so they pose some uh, quite a lot of problems. So very uh, quickly, we put uh, the tags on the feathers on the back of the bird. So we use okay. sort of a tape. It can last on the bird for weeks at least. At the beginning, we were deploying tags for short-term deployment because the tags were. The first tank we used uh, were relatively large, of course. There were 150 grams. Now we are using tanks that are 5 or 10 grams. So, but this is how the technology has changed over time. So apart from size decreasing, mm -hmm. are there any other advances of, or future directions for tagging technologies in seabirds that you foresee? Yeah, of course, we have followed all the technology. So we started with Argos transmitting uh, tags that give you some not very accurate location. And after, of course, we use a GPS tag when the GPS started to be miniaturized enough. After we use even smaller tag like GLS, geolocating system. So this is for the location of the bird. After we use plenty of other tags that record sample heart rate, the prey capture, all this kind of thing. And 
Recently, we developed this new tag that detects the ra radar emission of the, of, of the boat. This is to measure the external overlap between the bird and the boat because we don't have always the location of the boat. You can have the location of the boat through VMS systems. This is compulsory on fisheries that are regulated in some EEZ, but most of the fishing boats are not using this system. You can use the AIS system, so the, the system that any boat should have to avoid a collision between boats. But a lot of boats have not this system or switch the system off. So this means that there are plenty of boats, especially illegal fishing boats that are not using AAS system, of course no VMS system. And so with this system you can have an idea of the exact overlap of the albatross population with declared and non-declared uh, fisheries. And how are albatrosses doing at present? Because they're often in the news. Yeah, so presently there are mm -hmm. 22 species, so some species, for example, we have the smallest population of albatross, which is a critically endangered species, is uh, Amsterdam albatross. There are only uh, 50 pairs today, one of the few species that is increasing. But most of the population are either stable or declining. For example, wandering albatrosses they have been declining steadily in the 70s, uh, 80s, after they have increased, uh, and now they are stable, slightly decreasing. And we know from the demographic studies that there is a problem with the survival of a juvenile bird, and we know that the population will be declining in the coming uh, years. So situations are very different between species and even for the same species between populations. Right, Mike, we asked pretty much everybody else, but what do you see as the biggest challenges for technology going into the future? What's the next opportunity? Opportunity. 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 Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good excellent. Yeah, yeah. Finally, I got a reaction. Yeah, that's good. I like the opportunity. <laughs> The, the obvious ones, which I'm sure will be mentioned, will be battery life. The longer it stays on the animal, the more data you can collect. And also the size of the tags. They're getting increasingly smaller, particularly the acoustic tags, so you can put them into smaller fish and even juveniles. What I think will be really interesting is the an increase in peer-to-peer -peer tags. So that's tags that recognise when they're next to another animal. So then you can start to look at more social-based questions. So I think that's a big development to come in the marine field. But I know it's been used in terrestrial stuff. Right, Mike, I think I feel the need for more reptiles. Just to finish off with, and because reptiles are the best, let's return to the plight of marine turtles. We have another guest here, Nicole Esteban. Now, Nicole is a marine ecologist at Swansea University and is studying marine turtles. How awesome mm -hmm. is that? It certainly is. I'm very lucky to have that opportunity. So how has technology helped you to understand what sea turtles get up to? In a myriad of ways, actually, from using temperature loggers in the beach to satellite tags on turtles and depth loggers as well to record their depth whilst diving. So we first used satellite tags in 2005 to demonstrate to the government of a, an island in the Caribbean just where turtles were moving to and how they were using the local reef environment and seagrass beds for their foraging. At the moment, we've used the Argos locations, which are quite general, low-resolution accuracy, to demonstrate the foraging grounds for hawksbill and green turtles. What does Argos stand for? Argos is the name of a satellite network that is funded from Europe. They track a whole range of animals. So sea turtles are often equipped with Argos transmitters, so the locations are transmitted to the Argos satellite network, and then you can download the locations to your home computer. The new series of satellite tags uses fast hop GPS receivers. Then the tag is able to process those locations to have a much more accurate location of where the turtle is, and then those locations are beamed up to the Argos satellite network. So then we receive the more precise fast lock GPS locations as well as the Argos locations, which are several tens of metres less accurate. I'm really excited right now because you used the term beamed up. Yeah. <laughs> and that gets me very kind of excited, very techy. Or trekky. Yeah, or yeah. trekky, yes. So we've talked about how you would tag sharks with previous guests, as well as talking about how you would tag an albatross. How do you tag turtles then? Yeah, well, turtles are actually hard shell turtles. It's relatively easy to tag them because they have a nice hard shell and the females come up to the beach to nest. So you have several hours that they're on the beach so you can intercept them and tag them before they return to the sea. 
And they're also air breathers, so unlike sharks that are underwater most of the time, turtles come up every few minutes to breathe. And so then you have the clear air connection to send your satellite signal up to beam up to the satellite network. So how do you fix those tags onto a hard shell? Some groups use fibreglass, but we use um, epoxy resin to anchor the tags to the shell and then also to cover the outside of the tags in order to protect the tags from bumps. Then we coat that epoxy with anti-fouling paint, just what you'd use on a ship hull and that protects the tags from epibionts, so such as barnacles, for example, or algae from growing on the tag and stopping the tag from working properly. So where have those sea turtles gone to, the ones that you tracked? What are their favourite habitats? What are the kind of habitats that we might want to start thinking about conserving? We've been able to show in the Western Indian Ocean that green turtles have been migrating record-breaking distances up to 5,000 kilometres all the way to south of Madagascar to Mozambique and also Somalia and Kenya on the East African coast right from the centre of the Indian Ocean from Diego Garcia in the British Indian Ocean Territory. We're showing that they're going to very shallow areas with a very small, discrete home range. They're using less than one square kilometre of area for their main foraging grounds. So we're currently transmitting this information to the government of Seychelles, for example. They're setting aside certain areas of their exclusive economic zone as marine protected areas. And we're showing them that they're very shallow, using very shallow environments, less than 50 metres depth, very discrete areas as their home range. So you can protect green turtles at their foraging grounds very well with a series of small protected areas. So that's the type of information we're able to help conservation policy makers with. So what would be your biggest achievement with tagging technologies? Is there anything that stands out in particular or fond memories or even some tag failings? Yes, fortunately, not so many tag failings. We're lucky that the batteries work really well now, so we're able to have up to a year and a half to two years of transmissions. With my current work, the biggest achievement is we've been able to demonstrate new foraging grounds for green turtles. Previously, they weren't thought to use the British Indian Ocean Territory at all as a foraging ground. We've been able to discover huge areas of seagrass meadows at considerable depth with a species that doesn't usually grow at depth. So we've been able to extend satellite tracking beyond that to seagrass ecology and the value of the seagrass meadows on the Great Chagos Bank. So that's had a huge impact to protection of turtles at their foraging site, but also discovery of a new important critical ecosystem. So where do you see the future of marine tracking technology going? What would be on your ideal yeah. wish list? Well, one thing that I know across different species, we have issues with tracking at sea attachment of tags to male turtles for example that don't come up on the beach so we're learning more about how to capture those males and best attach satellite tags in an environment which is quite difficult to work in also attaching tags to juveniles uh, immature turtles which are really small and grow very quickly so normally a tag will only last a few weeks because as the carapace is growing the tag is no longer anchored so looking at the lost years of turtles those years from when they're hatchlings to when they start to settle at their development habitat, which might be eight years further on. So what are they doing? Where are they going? That's a real enigma at the moment. So some turtle biologists are using VHF transmitting devices, but they'll only work at a small range. So it's the miniaturisation of tags that I think is key. I look forward to seeing further miniaturisation to allow us to track smaller animals. Right, that was quite a lot of technological information there for us to digest. What have we learned? I think we've learned that it's pretty difficult to um, tag marine animals and can be quite costly, but there are a lot of people out there trying to work on different technologies to collect data on marine animals to find out where they're going to aid conservation efforts. Technologies can now monitor not only where the animals go, but where the humans go, so we can figure out how to best avoid future human-animal conflict, which is going to be a very important part of future conservation efforts for the marine species. Now, I learned, like, my favourite thing in the world, that you can sit around some ice, cut a hole in it, and a seal will pop up. 
And then you can tag it with an egg timer. Yeah, egg timer, kitchen timer. Yeah, that Fantastic. is just astonishing. I know I obviously picked the low tech solution, but sometimes the low tech's the best. And I think the other thing that we learned as well is that being a scientist doesn't mean that you're out and about with a little notebook. You actually have to learn a lot about technology, a lot about how to handle large data sets, how to analyze that data, ideally some computer programming, and how to do podcasts. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Morning.